What we are going to do today will be a little bit of philosophical introduction. Those who know me, you know that uh, this is what I typically do. So um, at the very beginning, we'll have a little bit thoughts about, you know, more generally about elasticity, plasticity effects, and how all of this fits together. Uh, then there is a, a list of topics that we should cover in this course, and they should roughly correspond to one topic to one lecture. The next lecture next week will be a little bit mathematical, talking about the uh, basic definitions, what are colors, vectors, tensors, and so on. And afterwards, we use this mathematical definition uh, to actually uh, define and understand what are these train tensors and tensor of thermal expansion. The lecture afterwards, we should be discussing properties of the stress tensor. We see a lot of uh, tensorial calculus here. Uh, then we'll make a short detour and uh, discuss piezoelectricity. Uh, so how are the generated charges and electric fields uh, related to the applied compressions and, and stresses in general. And then we come to the biggest topic, the linear elasticity, um, where again, we'll talk about the uh, definition of elastic constants, uh, their relation to the crystal symmetry um, and the different ways how to actually calculate them, what can we do about it. Um, something about polycrystalline elasticity as well. And so on. That will be the end of my part. And then uh, you will be introduced to the dislocations by Lawrence, who will uh, deal with the topics as they are mentioned here. Um, these are the chapter names from last year. So I hope that they will remain similar to this uh, after generally talking about dislocations, what they are. Uh, He'll be talking about the dislocations in linear elastic medium. And this is actually the connection between the elasticity and the dislocations. Okay? Uh, we again come to this point a little bit later today. Then he'll be uh, talking about the relationship between the crystalline structure and dislocations. And then he would move to uh, a little bit more engineering uh, description, what is of course needed for all of us doing material science. And uh, he'll be talking about the continuum description of how these locations move and how they are generated. And finally, how do they contribute to the strength of crystalline solids? And at the very end should come again one more session with me where we'll be talking about the relationships between the um, epitaxial uh, thin films, whether misfit dislocations at the interface relaxing some uh, lattice mismatch are convenient or not, what are their properties, again, how are they generated and what they do at all. So this is the plan for this term. And let me then dive directly into the introduction. So in the first place, we should try to understand or repeat what is the difference between elasticity and plasticity. Right? A typical example of elastic material is shown here and elastic behavior, a rubber band. Right? You deform it, you deform it almost uh, in a, any possible way. And after you release the applied forces, the applied stresses, the material comes back to its original shape. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, plastic deformation Again, a classical example here, a permanent deformation uh, being induced into the metal paper clip here is that you apply a force by which you deform the material, but at the moment you relieve the force from acting, the material remains deformed. That means the deformation that we induce by application of the force, of the stress, this uh, deformation remains permanent. The relationship between deformation and force or strain and stress is described in engineering terms by the load extension curve. Um, probably you have seen this uh, numerous times before. What we have here, for example, on the x-axis is the deformation 
described by the extension of the material, so the elongation of our material along the uh, axis along which an external force F is applied, right? the force we measure on the Y axis. And so for each deformation, we then get force. We simply measure these forces up to a certain point. And then at this point, when we relieve the force, or when actually the, uh, for the, the material breaks, the material, uh, the material returns to the state with no force, but certain permanent deformation. So this final state certainly corresponds to a plastic deformation, right? Where are we in the uh, elastic regime? Well, elastic regime is hard to say where we are uh, from, from this graph. Right? It could have been that if I went with my force up to this point here and relieved it, so now I start relieving the force and decreasing it, the material will be coming back to its original shape, so with no deformation. This would be still elastic deformation. Right? It could have been also that up from this point, so try a different color, I come up, I apply higher and higher force, the material uh, deforms more and more. And at this point, I now start relieving the force and the material returns into a different state. Again, leaving a permanent deformation. Right? This is something that I cannot say a priori from this curve. Uh, if the origin of the curve looks like this, that means that the force is linearly dependent on the applied deformation, or deformation is linearly dependent on the force, or equivalently, again, the strain and stress, though well, we haven't defined them yet, are linearly dependent on each other, then we would be talking about linear elasticity regime. At this point, linear elasticity means that simply the force or stress is proportional to the elongation or strain of our material. I can have material which is elastic, but the relationship is not linear. So I can be in non-linear elastic regime, right? And it's important to realize that there is a difference between non-linear elasticity and plasticity. Plasticity means that after relieving the force, releasing the force, I will end up with permanent deformation. So if now I come to this point here and relieve force again, and I end up with permanent deformation, then indeed in this part here, I was already in the plastic regime. And that means that at the moment where I'm starting entering this plastic regime, I reach so-called yield strength of the material. But yield strength of the material is not necessarily the end of the elastic regime. Typically, they are very close. They are very close for linearly elastic materials. But I might have, again, very nonlinear materials, which are elastic and still do not yield do not introduce permanent deformation. Tensile strength, another important term for, for mechanical properties. This is the maximum force or stress that a material can bear before breaking. Right? Whenever I apply a higher than this maximum stress, then the material breaks. So once more, coming back to the repetition of these terms. Elasticity is describing reversible deformation. Once more, not necessarily linear relationship between stress and strain or force and deformation. Whereas plasticity describes irreversible deformation, permanent deformation, which is always present even after relieving the force. Elasticity is therefore mostly given by the bonds, by stretching the bonds, by the 
electrons that form the interaction between atoms, trying to pull the atoms together. And it's therefore very much related to the chemistry of our material. On the other hand, plasticity is typically related to the defects, to their mobility, to their generation. And therefore, uh, the amount of defects, the uh, ability of material to generate defects, very much uh, determines the plastic behavior of a material. Right? Uh, you might know, if you take typical metallic material, which would be single crystalline, where there are no defects, no dislocations present, no point defects, that such material, despite being metallic, would be relatively brittle. Right? You need really a large force to deform it. But once you apply such a large form, then the material would be uh, likely to crack. On the other hand, if you have a material where you did already a lot of the formation before, you introduced in the material already, you generated already a lot of dislocations, right? Typically you take a piece of metal and you already bend it up and down a lot of times. You generate in the bending a lot of dislocations. Then to do a next bend is much, much easier. Right? The material just continues deforming plastic. It's far away from the single crystalline material you started with, the defect. I do have here a short movie, but instead of uh, instead of watching it here together, I propose that maybe you have a look at this uh, your own on a YouTube. Uh, you find the link uh, directly in the uh, lecture notes, or um, I'll put the link as well uh, on the on the Moodle, so you can just click it and, and watch it. It tells you something really how the elasticity is related to the bonds to stretching the bonds how the permanent plastic deformation is related to breaking bonds and subsequent rebonding. What is the difference between single crystal and point crystal? Very instructive video. Please have a look at it yourself. All right, I promised a little bit of philosophy. So I have here uh, two quotations. One is uh, two quotes. One is from uh, the English playwright, Morgan, William Morgan, who said, we know our friends by their defects rather than by merits, uh, meaning that um, it's much easier to spot what someone does wrong rather than what someone does right. And uh, as a parent, I can tell you, it's much easier to criticize and to find what the kids do badly rather than to say, hey, cool, you have done this perfectly, right? We tend to accept perfection as a standard and uh, defects as something which is, uh, which is out of ordinary. Uh, the second quotation comes from Salvador Dali, the famous Spanish painter who said, have no fear of perfection, you will never reach it. And that actually brings us back from the theoretical material science theoretical physics uh, back to reality. It's hardly ever any crystal around us which would be really single crystal. Definitely not in engineering materials. Right? Actually, the only, let's say, widespread single crystal around ourselves that we are using on a daily basis are silicon-based crystals or silicon technology. We live in the sil silicon era. And so all of this semiconducting technology is based on, um, well, almost defect-free materials. This is not the case of engineering materials, rails, construction, uh, steels, and so on. So all of there, we need to be aware of the defects and not to be necessarily scared of them, right? The defects are there. We have to get used to live with them and actually try to um, use them for our benefits. And with that, I'll like to bring you to the motto of this lecture and probably 
the future material science as well. Perfection is to a large degree boring, right? This is a very, very academic part. Defects are the game changer that bring the diversity, that bring the almost unlimited degree of uh, freedom in designing new materials and new functionalities. Many defects are unwanted. We want to avoid them in material science in our daily life. An example of broken concrete in this, uh, in this bridge, I believe that was somewhere in, in France, if I'm not mistaken, or the very well-known example, I believe you have seen this photograph in the uh, metallurgy classes already uh, as a typical example of a uh, brittle fracture on the, on the uh, first, uh, first war uh, ship uh, scan attack. Right. So uh, that was the very first example when this uh, when this uh, large scale brittle fracture was observed in the very cold waters, and was uh, by the time kind of uh, unclear what is happening and why actually the material becomes very brittle at low temperatures. Right. These are certainly unwanted defects. Um, we can go down to much lower scales and uh, bring our attention more towards the uh, focus of this course, these locations. What you see on this picture here is actually a silicon, well, pretty much single crystal with one dislocation being generated, right? The dislocation is centered exactly here. And uh, from those of you who have heard about these locations before, can you say, well, it's written here, it's a stupid question to say which type of dislocation it is. It's a screw dislocation, right? You see here nicely the build of the terrace, which goes like uh, a spiral from the center. And again, how this is related to the crystalline uh, structure of the material, you'll be talking uh, with Lawrence more in detail. Maybe a question which is related to that. Can anyone tell me what is the orientation of this silicon crystal? Would you dare to say what is the direction that goes into the uh, screen? Miller indices of this direction. Anyone? No. One, one, one. One, one, one. Bingo. Right. Even the answer no is fair enough. Okay. As uh, no, nothing, nothing bad to, to uh, say. I don't know. I don't have any results. I don't have any answer. I don't know. But one, one, one is the correct answer. Can you say why is it one, one, one direction? <clears throat> because it's. Um... From an energy point, uh, the, 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 the lowest level, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, would you be able to say that based on what you see on this picture here? If you look at how are these terraces formed when you are far away from the dislocation core, right? You are somewhere here you are building hexagonal shapes and it's very it's light. the it's the um uh, even uh, <laughs> with yeah, the highest fine. density excellent excellent yes exactly so you are very likely to actually uh, have these facets along some low index directions in the crystal and now you have to think about what is the crystalline structure of silicon. You remember that this is a diamond structure, which is a based on face centered cubic. And then you would remember which are the planes with the hexagonal symmetry. Exactly those are the planes with the uh, highest packing density. And you would then figure out that these planes here are actually the one, one, one planes. And in cubic materials, we know that the direction perpendicular to the plane 
has the same Miller indices. So actually this would be the direction one, 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 right? Very good, very good. Uh, these locations are really unwanted in semiconducting um, industry. And as an example of why are they unwanted, I have here another example, and these are now in gallium nitride. Have you heard about gallium nitride before? Do you know where is this used for? Semiconductor again. Again, semiconductor, very good. Do you know any application of gallium nitride? The bullets. Bullets. Do you have gallium nitride at home? Maybe in our cell phones. Yes. Maybe cell phones, all right. Have to admit that I'm not 100% sure about that. Could be, could be. The application that maybe might be outdated. Maybe you are too young for that, right? But uh, uh, did you remember Blu-ray devices, Blu-ray uh, technology? Yes. Blu-ray discs? Yes, 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 exactly. The laser for the Blu-ray disc. Exactly. So the Blu-ray meaning really that the laser is not red as in the classical CDs and so on, but it's a blue, uh, so short wavelength laser. This is all made possible because of gallium nitride. Right? So it's a semiconductor with very wide band gap, much, much wider than silicon. And as a consequence of that, it allowed for this short wavelength technology. All right. And so- Is it a direct or indirect uh, semiconductor? I think direct. Gallium nitride is a direct semiconductor, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there would be people even saying that it's not a semiconductor, right? That the band gap is so large. Well, here it's around 3.6 electron volts, but it's often alloyed with aluminum and then leading to over five EVs. And many people would say that this is already an insulator. It's really, really large band gap semiconductor. Now, what you see on the picture here in the left bottom corner is gallium nitride, where on the right hand side you see a network of blue stri uh, sorry, <laughs> black stripes and black dots. Now, these black stripes and dots, or lines and dots, are dislocations, right? Line defects. That's why they are lines. Uh, some of them are points because the dislocations are then perpendicular to the plane of observation. On what you see on the left hand part of this image here is a cathode luminescence image. So you really probe the image and you try to emit light out. And then you see these black spots. These black spots, they are where there is no light emitted, no visible light emitted. And it was shown that these points, these areas are closely related to the presence of dislocations. So what you actually say is that the dislocations kill or quench the luminescence. Simply the presence of these defects kills the functionality of this material. You know, you want the gallium nitride to shine the short wavelength light. If you have the defect there, it kills it. And similar way, the dislocations in semiconductor would, would act as a conducting highways for the charges and would essentially kill the semiconducting behavior of silicon, right? So this is the, these are all examples of unwanted defects. But not all defects are unwanted necessarily. An example here of uh, titanium nitride based materials, uh, which are used as uh, barriers in, uh, again, some semiconducting uh, materials. Uh, but uh, they are very much used also as a hard protective coatings for protecting cutting tools. And then if you think about titanium nitride, as a material which is used in these cutting applications at high temperatures, you see how the hardness of the material drops down with the temperature, which is of course unwanted. You want to have the material hard to, uh, to be durable. 
Now imagine uh, you add some material, some aluminum into this perfect crystal, right? Uh, you are doing alloying, which to a certain degree can be seen as introducing defects, introducing substitutional atoms into our, our material. Of course, the question is to say whether 66% of uh, aluminum atoms is still a scarce defect or whether this is really a new material, right? In this perspective, I want to still see it as a, as a defect. And uh, the room temperature hardness of the material increases. But what is even more important is that the hardness drop is, uh, is postponed to much, much higher temperatures. That means the high hardness is retained for this titanium aluminum nitride coating uh, to much higher operational temperatures and therefore significantly improves the lifetime of the tool and such defect is of course beneficial for the operation. Again, you might say that 66% is way too much. <clears throat> and so we maybe want to think about much smaller amount of defects. So think about nickel titanium shape memory alloy. Nickel titanium stoichiometric intermetallic compound would be at 50-50 composition. So then when we go from 50 to 51% of nickel, that means we have essentially 1% of anticides in the material, or maybe 1% of titanium uh, vacancies in the material, who knows? Essentially we change the nickel to titanium ratio very little. Look how much does the temperature where this shape memory effect happens drops. We can use this imperfection of the chemical content, this imperfection of our uh, ideal uh, intermetallic composition. We can use it to tune the functional response of the material in the range of, let's say, 80 to minus 120 degrees C right in the range of 200 degrees here. It's a huge range, huge playground, and huge sensitivity of the material to actually the chemical composition, to the presence of defects. In this case, most likely point defects. And if you say that the defects may not be useful, they can be at least very, very interesting. Here is an example of uh, carbon buckyballs, carbon nanostructures uh, composed of many carbon atoms, right? You put them in football-like network. So that means we have somewhere here pentagons. You remember how many pentagons are on football? Hmm? How many do we have? Anyone, any fan of football? Uh, I think 12. 20. 20, that would be too many. 12 is the correct answer. 12 is the correct answer. Yeah. Uh, very good. Very good. Uh, next time you go play football, count the, I think it's usually the black spots on the, on the football first. Um, and each of them on the football is then surrounded with five hexagons around them, right? And next to the hexagon is another pentagon. And this is how the football is created. Uh, this would be uh, overall corresponding to 60 molecules, uh, 60 atoms of carbon that form such a molecule, C60 fullerene. And now you start actually expanding on this scheme. You keep the 12 pentagons, and instead of putting one ring around the hexagon, uh, around the pentagons, so one ring of hexagons, you put there two rings. So in between each two pentagons, is not one single hexagon, but there are two hexagons. Right? And you keep doing this, and eventually from really nicely spherical football, which is the C60 molecule, you come to larger and larger and larger molecules, and they would start becoming faceted, like you see here, right? This is really faceted here, and at each of these apexes, you have the pentagon. Fair enough. This is the theoretical prediction. This is the shape of the molecule you, you expect. And you go to the experiment and you observe such fullerene. And hmm, what's this? It's almost nicely spherical, right? 
unlike the material that we have predicted. And then you start thinking what might be happening here. And you realize that these observations are done using electron microscope. It means you bombard the material with electrons. And the electrons are sometimes causing damage to your material as well. It's really like shooting projectiles on your material. And eventually they would lead to kicking out some carbon atoms. And most likely those carbon atoms, which are uh, the most, um, the, the, the most, let's say, uh, defected ones or close to the defected uh, areas, right? those which are most energetically expensive. What is the ground state of carbon? Ground state of carbon is graphene, right? Or diamond, but graphene is another, uh, let's say, low energy lying structure, which are sheets of hexagons. So actually the hexagonal network, the honeycomb network, is something which is a natural structure of carbon. Very good. But that means that if we kick out those atoms which are near to the pentagons, we make holes there, the whole material actually is probably relieving its energy. So we end up with just a network with hexagons as it wants to be. Uh, carbons want to be sp2, hybridized sp2 bonded. But then if you look at such material, even in the simulations, the final shape is not any more faceted, but it's nicely spherical as here shown in the middle. Right? So then the defects can be, well, at least interesting from this point of view that they can completely shape, uh, change shape of your material, response of your material, and can lead uh, to actually explaining the discrepancy between theory and experiment. Interactive session. Shoot at me some defects that you see in here. What do you see? How can you name them in this crystalline material? There is an interstitial atom. Interstitial atom. What's the color of interstitial atom? Uh, it's the, the red one at the lower left side. Very good. Interstitial atom. Anything else? Vacancy. Vacancy. <laughs> yeah. I said vacancy, and it's pretty much in the middle of the... Yes. There we have a vacancy. Very good. Yes? Anything else? A substitution uh, atom. Yeah, very good. Substitutional atom here. Anything else? Is this one a substitutional atom as well? Well, it is, right? It again, you would expect to have there a green atom and instead of that, substituted by the red atom. But we have a couple of them here together. How is this then called? Probably. Particle. Particle, very good. Or inclusion or precipitate, right? All of these would be terms describing this defect. Good, what about this guy here? Interstitial. Very good, interstitial. It's just self-interstitial, right? It's the same atom, but again, interstitial. Hmm, I do see some deformation in this area. What do we have here? Dislocation. Very good. Which type of dislocation? A step dislocation. What was it? Stufenversetzung. Yeah, now I need help with the translation. Step. <laughs> is it step dislocation? Step. Okay, H, H dislocation. Yeah. Okay. How, is it, how is it in German again? Stufenversetzung. Stufenversetzung. Very good. Okay. And the other one is? Schraubenversetzung. Schraubenversetzung. Good. That would be a direct mm -hmm. translation from English as well. The screw yes. dislocation. Yes. Good. So this one we will remember is the edge dislocation that we have here, right? I see you are all set to go directly to the oral examination. You do not need any more any discussion about dislocations, but maybe you'll uh, learn from us 
still something new from Lawrence Lakes. There are a couple of more dislocations here if you want to see them, right? There would be a dislocation here as well and a dislocation here. So this you would call a dislocation dipole. You can also see a dislocation if you want here and here. So there is essentially a missing plane here. Again, a dislocation dipole. And if you would be really, really curious, you, you can see that this vacancy here is actually a set of couple of dislocations, right? Arranged this way. But we do not call this as a quadruplet of dislocations. We call it really vacancy. I'm not sure whether we managed to find all of them, but probably we did all or most of them, right? So I think we managed to have a look at all of those guys, right? Interstitial substitution on also very well. Good. So how do we classify the defects? We classify them based on their dimensional. It's zero dimensional or point defects, vacancies, interstitials, substitutional atoms, antisides. I believe the first three of them are clear to you. Do you know what is an antiside? It's uh, when you have an ordered binary system. Can you think about any ordered binary phase? Come on, guys. Metallurgy one. Any one of you had anything to do with steel? Yes, please. Steel? Steel, steel, right. Uh, there's not really an ordered intermetallic phase, right? But in steels, there is one which F -E is very, C. very good, very good, very good. No one can live in Leoben without the cementite, right? Fe3C. Now, this is an ordered intermetallic, well, it's actually not intermetallic, right? It's carbide. Uh, intermetallic phase would be maybe the titanium aluminite again. I believe you have heard from Professor Clements some of these, or you have heard from me before the nickel titanium, another one. Good. But let's focus on uh, the cementite, the iron three carbon. The atoms on such a lattice are well arranged, right? I do have a sublattice of iron atoms, of sublattices. I do have a sublattice of carbon atoms. The atoms sit on only certain positions, and there is an interconnection uh, or interlace of these lattices. And now imagine, and actually the easiest would be to imagine really maybe the nickel titanium here, which is a body-centered structure. Okay, I try to draw it here. Right, something like this. So this is the BCC uh, structure. That means in the middle, we have another atom, right? That's the one sitting there. And all the blue atoms are nickel and the red one is, is titanium, for example. And now what you see here uh, is the perfect structure. Uh, if now it happens that instead of a red atom here would be sitting a blue atom, you get an antiside defect. It's an atom which is there because it belongs there chemically, but it sits on the wrong sublattice. So this is antiside defects. In iron, in iron carbide, in the cementide, it would be that an iron atom sits on the carbon sublattice or carbon occupies an iron side. In TIAL gamma phase, that would mean that aluminum sits on titanium sublattice or vice versa, right? It sits on the wrong side, lattice side. That's why the anti-side uh, defect name comes from. Line defects, one-dimensional defects in the last one minute. Uh, these are dislocations or disclinations. And you'll be talking about this much more later on. But dislocations are essentially in this Volterra um, construction defects where I cut my cylinder and then I displace it 
along different directions, either perpendicular to the cut or here along the cut or here along the cut and the axis. These two are the edge dislocations, Stufenversetzungen, I have learned, and these are screw dislocations, Schraubenversetzungen. Disclinations are then when I change the angles between these cut planes. Right? This is hard to imagine what this would mean in perfect single crystalline materials. This is not con uh, contained there, but disclinations might be, for example, appearing in, uh, in carbon nanotubes. Right? 2D defects or plane defects, stacking faults and grain boundaries, Stabenfälle and Korngrenzen. I believe, again, both of these you have uh, heard many times before, and they are actually not the topic of this lecture. And 3D or volumetric defects, precipitates, voids, or to some degree cracks as well, if you want to see it as a, as a really volumetric uh, part where the material is missing. And that brings me to the final note for today. Uh, Excuse me. Like, yes. A question. Uh, there exist uh, defects dependent on the time by resonant structures. Yeah. They yeah. exist. The question is whether they exist. Yes. Right. So actually, the defects that we talk about here would be mostly really permanent defects. So their lifetime is, is infinite. Apart from, for example, Frankel defects, which would be an atom jumping from its uh, atomic side into a neighboring interstitial side and forming a pair of interstitial vacancy. These would have a final lifetime. Yeah? Thank you. You're welcome. So what I wanted to make uh, here, the final note, the name of the, the lecture is called Elasticity and Dislocations. Now, Elasticity, we said, is something related to the bonds and to a non-permanent deformation. You release the force and the deformation is gone. Whereas dislocations are typical examples of uh, defects that govern the plastic deformation that make the permanent dislocation in our material. Once I take the Volterra dislocation, the atom jumps from here to there, and here they rebound again, it will be a stable configuration again, and I have a dislocation. However, majority of the description of dislocations, the classical theory of dislocations in the continuum sense is done using elasticity. Dislocations are actually, especially their stress field and energies can be to a very large, degree described by the elastic deformations, which are, well, a little bit away from really where the dislocation core is, where really the broken bonds are. Uh, but this is the major, major contribution to the behavior of dislocations. And so in the first part, we review again the elasticity. In the second part of the course, we then apply this elasticity to describe uh, the dislocations as the governance of the plastic deformation.